Hi, I'm Kristen Oaks-White. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. Avery Davidson is on assignment this week. Fruit and vegetable production contributes more than $1.1 million to Louisiana's economy. That's according to the LSU Ag Center's Ag Summary. Now, you can have fresh, locally grown food delivered right to your doorstep. That's the idea behind Indie Plate, an online delivery service that connects consumers with fresh food grown or raised by local farmers. Twilight's AJ Sabine takes us along for delivery. With a quick knock at the door, Indie Plate owner Ben Bartage completes another delivery of locally grown food to Baton Rouge celebrity chef Jay Ducote. Ducote, who is a longtime customer of Indie Plate, pulls out bags of freshly harvested produce and lamb sourced from our family farms in a meat Louisiana. Ducote says it's like Christmas when Indie Plate delivers. When you have this kind of cauliflower delivered right to your doorstep that was grown locally, uh, delivered uh, from the farmer straight to my table, and Indie Plate just helps be that middleman to, to connect those dots. Um, but there's really nothing, uh, nothing as flavorful as all this produce that's grown locally, that uh, is much fresher. It's been much less time since it was harvested. Uh, we got these uh, heirloom purple snap peas. I'm gonna, I'm gonna really enjoy these coming up pretty soon. Indie Plate co-founder Ben Bartage explains how he came up with the idea for the two and a half year old startup. My business partner and I have a real passion for supporting local farms and local businesses and we saw that they could really benefit from having an additional sales channel um, and on top of that we, we saw a perfect opportunity you know I um, think that people are um, leaning more towards knowing where their food comes from the slow food movement and thought that Indie Plate would be a great way to you know kind of help the farms out while simultaneously meeting a need um, that customers have. How does it work? Cue the internet. Customers sign up online and choose from a myriad of locally sourced foods. Product procurement manager Brandon Rich explains the value of the relationship between Louisiana growers and Indie Plate. So the great service that we really provide for farmers is the ability to allow them to market and sell their products to an entirely different group of people than they normally would. Uh, for example, a lot of our procurement process runs through New Orleans farmers markets as well as Baton Rouge. So these are farmers who being that they only sell physically at the New Orleans market, now have the opportunity to really add a Baton Rouge market to their typical sales where they normally wouldn't have those people coming and shopping with them on a Tuesday or a Saturday. So. Bartage currently delivers these chilled bags of tasty goodness in the Baton Rouge area. However, he envisions a regional delivery service. And in case you were wondering, delivery is free. We'd like to support a cluster of farms in Louisiana and then a cluster of farms in Texas and then a cluster of farms in Florida to where you basically have these regional farm to table supply chains supplying both customers and restaurants. Indie Plate updates its product list every week to provide its customers with the best selection of fresh food. For more information about Indie Plate, log on to our website at twilatv.org. In DeSoto Parish, farmers raising cattle and poultry are contributing as much money to the economy as its timber industry, according to the LSU Ag Center's Ag Summary. In this edition of Louisiana Farm Life, Twila's Carl Wiggers introduces us to a farmer there who has played a big part in making that economic shift happen. Yeah. A few miles from Logansport, Joey Register works his cattle on horseback. However, what is happening now is a lifetime in the making for Register. I always, always, always knew that I wanted to farm when I grew up. I had a desire, and my brother the same. If we played in the backyard in the dirt, we were building little farms in the dirt. From those humble beginnings, Joey and his brother Craig now farm together around 400 head of beef cattle. There you go. Put them back in there. Today they're using their dogs to move some cattle to the working pens where they'll tag and vaccinate this year's calves. The Register brothers also put their dogs to work for some of their neighbors. We're on routine maintenance with them. We do their spring and fall calf, uh, calf work for them, you know, worming cows, castrating, vaccinating the steer, you know, bull calves. These dogs play a major role in the work that goes on here at the farm. But off of the farm, Joey's dogs have another purpose. Wild hog hunting. Man, we love it. We uh, 
swine eradication, what I try to sound professional with it. We do a lot of that. Those hunts start in the backyard, getting the dogs ready to go. We'll vest them up, try to protect them the best we can from getting cut up by the boar hogs. Then it's off to the woods where Joey, his friends, and his four-legged hunters chase after these wild hogs. In recent years, they've become a major issue for farmers across the state. And while it's a rush and a fun time for Joey and his dogs, at the end of the day, his goal remains to help his neighbors. You know, there's way, way too many. We're trying to help the farmers. We try to eradicate them as much as we can by any means as we can. Register's desire to help his neighbors and his drive to be a successful farmer both stem from his growing up on a dairy, seeing firsthand the hard times that come with life on a farm. I mean, I saw struggles. I saw serious struggles because you didn't have government just throwing money is you may do with what you had. And uh, I said, I'm going to make this thing work. Knowing these struggles, Register was ready for the life of a farmer as soon as he finished high school. I had several cows milking in a barn that I worked at and uh, went to an FSA officer and said, I want to buy this dairy farm. He said, you're too young. Sell your cows, go to college. He said, I ain't doing it. Had a business plan worked up. I was 18. And uh, he said, I'll see you back one day. When I got out and come back and got the opportunity to buy the chicken farm, I went back to him. And he said, you were my very first denial. He said, I know exactly who you are. He said, you went to college, didn't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm ready to work. And from those chicken houses to the cow pen, through good times and bad, Joey Register lives his dream every day doing what he loves. Joey has now been the president of DeSoto Parish Farm Bureau for more than a decade. He was also a very active part of the Young Farmer and Ranchers program, as well as a graduate of the LSU Ag Leadership Program. Another really interesting thing about Joey is his way of bringing the farm to the table. Each year, he welcomes his entire community to his backyard to share the blessings of the farm with those around him. It's a group effort that he leads with the help of other farmers, business owners from across the area, and churches from all around the parish. And Kristen, in the package you saw the hog hunt. I got to go on that obviously, but I put the camera down and got to get my hands on the hog and it was really neat. And something a lot of people didn't realize when I posted the picture on Facebook, that that hog was actually alive still. I didn't realize that and I posted it. I thought it was, I thought that you killed the hog and I was very proud of you for doing that. I can't take <laughs> but credit. But apparently you really didn't have your hands full of it was alive. I can't take my credit. It was a live hog. It was strapped up. The legs were tied up real good, thank goodness. But it, it was really neat. They take the hogs live and they put them in a pen and they do it, a few different op things with them. But it was, it was a really, really, it was quite a rush. It looked like a, a really exciting story to go on. It, it was a lot of fun. Probably my, mm, I've had a lot of fun stories, but this was probably the most uh, hands-on for sure. Right. <laughs> so far. It was an exciting and great story, Carl Wiggers. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, once every year, the Louisiana Farm Bureau's young farmers and ranchers spend a day at the state capitol to meet their lawmakers and see their governmental process firsthand. At this year's Wife and Our visit, the group was recognized in a House committee meeting. For many of them, this was their first time in the capitol building. The group got to meet with representatives who sat on committees that represent their interests in both agriculture and rural affairs. This was not the first trip there for Wife and Our chair, Amelia Kent, but she says every visit is an important visit because legislation impacts their farms and their lives. One of my first visits to the state capitol with wife and our five, eight years ago, something like that, um, was when the privatized railroad crossings were a major issue rolling through the state house. And we actually had young farmers who would have been directly impacted by that bill, one way or the other, whether it went positively or negatively. Um, they would have been, their farm, them personally, they would have been impacted by that bill. So. Yes, we had a farmer presence to tell that first-hand personal story on, on the effects. That railroad bill Kent referred to was a major victory for Farm Bureau and represented the first time the legislature passed a law railroad companies found unfavorable. More pictures and highlights of the wife and our visit can be found online. You can visit our website at twilighttv.org to see more. Well, there are a few times when you have to do a bit more than just visit lawmakers to get their attention. For a couple of commodity groups, that strategy is simple. You feed them. This is the annual egg breakfast sponsored by the Louisiana Egg Commission and Louisiana Poultry Federation. The folks here cooked up about 200 omelets and crepes for Louisiana Senators and their staff, as well as others working at the State Capitol. This is a very popular event at the State Capitol each year. This year, the impromptu chefs had to set up at the Pentagon Barracks because of the construction in the area where they normally cook. 
It was at the egg breakfast where conservation groups put to paper their commitment to conservation, a commitment which brings results like the de delisting of the black bear and stronger deer population across the state. The relationship between the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry, and all the soil and water conservation districts has been strong for about 70 years. Now, representatives from all of those groups have signed their names to continue that commitment. NRCS State Conservationist Kevin Norton led the signing of a memorandum of understanding to show the commitment to conservation with the goal of building upon past success. We're here today to really just to uh, celebrate the successes of the past, but then also to uh, formalize the way we'll work forward into the future to make sure that we are delivering conservation that's relative to Louisiana's ag, pr ag producers livestock producers and forest landowners. So it's really a, a, it's a, it's a, a celebration, but then it's also a commitment to working together forward for uh, our, on behalf of our agriculture producers. To learn more about the NRCS, visit our website at twilatv.org. Still to come on Twyla, we see how you celebrate Egg Month online in our Trending on Twyla segment. But first, using a Louisiana dairy to promote milk across the South. Stay with us. The Walnut family of East Baton Rouge Parish has distinguished itself as the last working dairy in the capital region. The Southeast United Dairy Industry Association, better known as Sudia, will feature the Womacks in a television commercial promoting hard-working dairy families across the Southeast. Just north of Baton Rouge in Zachary, an Atlanta video crew records interviews for a series of dairy producer profiles that will ultimately promote the dairy industry in the Southeast. The Southeast United Dairy Industry Association chose the Womacks because of the couple's activism in promoting the industry. Joy Womack, who sits on the Louisiana Farm Bureau Women's Leadership Committee, says she was honored to be a part of Sudia's Media Blitz promoting dairy farmers and their families here in the Southeast. It's an honor to be able to promote something that you believe so much in. And if you believe that much in something, it is a privilege and an honor. Sudia shot four promotional spots here in Louisiana, and all four of those spots will be used to promote dairy families in all nine member states of the organization. In this week's Trending on Twyla segment, we scan the news feed to see what you guys are talking about on social media. Miss America Betty Cantrell used her crown to shine the spotlight on agriculture this week. Cantrell posted this photo while she was touring a Minnesota farm and the post went viral on Facebook. Cantrell grew up on a farm in Georgia and now works with the American Farm Bureau Federation to promote her platform, Healthy Children, Strong America. May is National Egg Month and social media users are posting plenty of excellent posts to recognize the holiday. The Ohio Poultry Association is tweeting new recipes and dozens of fun facts about eggs to their followers during the month of May. World Kitchen LLC also tweeted this infographic with some great facts about eggs. The American Farm Bureau Foundation posted an excellent article about where eggs actually come from to debunk a lot of the myths surrounding all of the different variations of eggs you can find in the grocery store. And we end this trending segment with a little produce picking tip that went viral on Facebook. Alfonso Garcia posted this photo with a few tips to pick the perfect watermelon. After watching people constantly thump and bang on melons, he said, the trick is simple. Pick the ugly melon with lots of spots and a yellow bottom. So I guess that's what you need to know is pick the ugliest melon in the patch. I didn't know that. I constantly thump them even though I don't know what I'm thumping for. Well now it's time to move on to this week's Twyla Trivia. Last week I asked you, on average, how many hours do teachers work per week? And the correct answer is B, 52 hours. This week's trivia question is, the average hen will lay about how many eggs per year? Is it A, 300, B, 400, or C, 500. To enter this week's trending trivia contest, simply log on to your Facebook or Twitter account and post your answer with the hashtag Twyla Trivia, or you can always submit your answer on our website at twilatv.org. Still to come on Twyla, investing in agriculture is a sure return for your bottom line. But first, we learn if you're ready and willing, where you should serve. Stay with us. Last year's disappointing wheat harvest in Louisiana has led to a dramatic reduction in acres for this year's crop. As Craig Gotro shows us, farmers planted about 60,000 acres this year. 
Last year's wheat crop in Louisiana was devastated by scab disease. Its lingering effects are still being felt as farmers have drastically reduced acreage this year. LSU Ag Center wheat specialist Boyd Paget says Louisiana has about 60,000 acres of wheat this year, a significant decrease from the typical 200,000 acres. It just left a bad taste in growers' mouths. They did not want to plant wheat. Uh, they were skittish. Combine that with low commodity prices, quite frankly, probably would not have planted wheat as well. Paget says the year following a severe outbreak of scab disease, crops are at risk of having a reoccurrence. He said fungicides offer limited control and recommendations are to apply them by ground spray rigs, which is difficult when fields are wet. You can expect with a perfect application about 50% suppression. So if you back up and put it out by air, it's even going to be less. With wheat prices low, farmers must consider the potential value of the crop to both the fungicide and the application cost. If you're growing wheat, you need to make money. And you need to recoup your application costs plus some more. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a good scenario. While not a major crop in Louisiana, there are benefits for farmers to grow wheat. It's grown as a cover crop. So it conserves soil moisture, builds organic matter, and, also, and that's in addition to growing the crop as a grain. So it provides additional income to producers year-round. According to Pageant, this year's crop is in fair to good shape, but it is now entering the growth stage where it is most susceptible to scab. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gotro reporting. Well, in last week's Bottom Line, we took a look at the way investment firms affect market prices. But speculators aren't just impacting the price for grains and other commodities. Joining us now is Neil Malawson. And Neil, these investment firms have affected agriculture in a really big way. They have. And, uh, you know, in the same way that uh, we saw that in the investment firms affecting grain prices, they're affecting land prices as well. The two are related. And there's been some recent stories about how investment groups are either buying land directly or investing money in farms, including a story in the Baton Rouge Advocate here last week. Really, there was a frenzy of buying two years ago when commodity prices were soaring. Then, as now, investment speculators were buying up grains as a way to grow their money. It's worked for them in the past, but last year when the fundamentals of supply and demand caught up to the grains, we saw a steep drop-off both in prices and in outside investment. For long-term investment, ag land is where investors have increasingly turned to. In the last year, land prices have stabilized as commodity values plummeted. However, other commodities have sunk as well, like oil and gas, and even though the stock market has increased in value, it remains risky, whereas today, tomorrow, and forever, people will have to eat. Now, according to Kyle McCann, that's what makes ag land a magnet for long-term investors right now. One of the things that they've seen when they're looking at the various prospectuses is, is the increase in land values that's occurred over time, and not only on that basis, but also the annual returns from the operation. So both of those are attractive to them, particularly considering the other options they have in a very unstable world where here is an asset that stays here, it's uh, safe, and has been noted to have very steady returns over a long period of time. The bottom line is, it's good news and bad news for farmers and consumers. The bad news is that investments mean it's expensive for farmers looking into buying land and it costs even more to rent it. And that's not good when it comes to commodity values and they sink lower. This can add costs for what you pay at the grocery store as well. And Kristen, the good news is, is that a lot of these investment firms are buying land to keep them in agriculture at a time when urban sprawl is buying up land to sink it into shopping centers and real estate development, you know, that includes uh, houses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like I tell people, when was the last time you heard houses being plowed under for farmland? And it, it never happens. That's true. And don't you wish that you just had your hands on some prime farmland that oh, you yeah. own to rent yeah, out? Right in a point could pee parish, man. I'd be I'd be rolling in the dough. We would be. We wouldn't have to have this job. Exactly. But who would give you your ag news? Well, yeah. Yeah, we'd have to. We'd just have our, our, our servant bring it to us. <laughs> Neil Malasso, thanks. Well, that does it for this edition of, bottom, of The Bottom Line and Twyla. Be sure to join us next week when A.J. Sabine will take us to central Louisiana where we'll go feasting on agriculture. Until then, you can watch all of our stories online on our website at twylatv.org. And be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. For all of us here at Twyla, thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week. Farming is my way of life. 
I chose this career, but farming chose me. You have just a profound feeling of wanting to do this that you can't really explain. You just know within yourself, I've got to do this, I want to do this. I'm so motivated and driven by it, I've got to be part of it. It's like some kind of disease that you can't get away from and you just have to do it because it's what makes you happy. It takes a lot of devotion, a lot of dedication to be a dairy farmer, you know, you have to work seven days a week. And, and it's not for everybody, it's something that, you know, you just got to be either raised in it or born in it, and you got to love it. Agriculture and farming is a way of life. It's not a job. I know we consider it a business because it's a livelihood, but you really have to love the idea of being close to the earth and close to nature. I love putting seed in the ground. That's the beginning of life. And in that seed is everything that's capable to happen that year. It's just a tremendous feeling to see something that is, comes from nothing and turns into something that is uh, produces. It's a great feeling to see that crop come to fruition. I like what I do. I mean, there, there, there's nothing else I would rather do than just what I'm doing right now. But yeah, there have been years that it, it has been very challenging. Sometimes the challenge would almost outweigh your, your wheel. We struggled so many times it was hard. You know, rice prices was down, hurricanes came in. The weather, the rain, I mean, the drought and the heat. Mother Nature is, is what really controls this. This is what comes with farming, and uh, this is why you have to love it to do it because it's uh, it's a roller coaster ride, year in and year out. I mean, you can have a very perfect plan, and there's always going to throw a wrench in it. When you have problems with the farm, whether it's in the hay field or breakdown or even sick livestock, that doesn't end at the office. That there isn't a nine to five, and you can leave that at the office. Farming has taught me to persevere. Uh, that's probably the most important lesson I've learned is, is that things are going to go wrong. Um, they do go wrong. And we got to get up and face, face the problems, overcome them. Probably the most important thing anybody can ever do. Because if it wasn't for farmers, then we wouldn't have food. We wouldn't have clothes. We wouldn't have anything. I'd say it puts you in touch, direct touch with yourself in an effort where you're nurturing and growing things. You watch them come out of the ground. It's the, the very magical part of, of what we do that you're involved with it every day and you see it to fruition. But you're constantly involved in that. You're very much a part of it. It's not routine. It's not common. It's not predictable. It's not droning on and going into the same routine all the time. It's always fresh, always different. It's very threatening and it's very rewarding. It, it's a wonderful way to, to live life. I am a cotton farmer. I am a farm woman. I'm a cattleman. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I am a dairy farmer. I am a support system. I'm a fifth generation farmer. I'm a conservationist of our land. I'm a future farmer. I am Farm Bureau. 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 I am a Farm Bureau.